Could the current geopolitical situation spark a global conflict? It's a question that's been hanging over our heads for quite some time now. In mid-October of this year, a sociological survey was presented at a security policy conference in Germany. This survey identified the main concerns troubling German society. The foremost concern? Migration. But a close second was the fear of war or the potential for conflict. Similar concerns resonate in Latvia, where the question of security and potential aggression from Russia, closely tied to the outcome of the conflict in Ukraine, is a topic of extensive public discussion. For several years now, security has been a top priority for the Latvian government. Efforts have been made to strengthen the national armed forces, increasing personnel, technical support and firepower. Additional funding has been allocated to internal security and work is underway on a comprehensive national defence system designed to prepare Latvian society for various crises or potential war. National defence education has been introduced in schools and voluntary reservist training programmes are being implemented. Many experts agree that even in the event of a Ukrainian victory, Russia will continue to pose a threat to Latvia's independence. The question then arises, has everything possible been done for Latvian defence? If not, what more could be done? And how could it be done better? Given Latvia's membership in NATO and the European Union, the question of which allies we can count on becomes increasingly relevant, especially considering the political processes in our allied countries. Let's delve into the geopolitical situation since the 24th of February, 2022. The war in Ukraine, defending against Russian invasion, has been ongoing for one year and nine months. When initiating this conflict, Russia's political circles miscalculated expecting a lightning war. The plan was to take over Kiev in three days, change the Ukrainian government, and gain control over the country. It was assumed that Western countries would limit their response to diplomatic condemnations, as they had in similar situations in the past, such as Russia's invasion of Georgia in 2008, or the annexation of Crimea in 2014. However, this time the Western community, the European Union and NATO, quickly overcame their initial shock and agreed on economic and military support for Ukraine. At the same time, they made decisions to further strengthen their security on what is called the Alliance's eastern flank. In the wake of recent events, the Western society, comprising the European Union and NATO, swiftly overcame their initial shock and agreed on providing economic and military support to Ukraine. Concurrently, decisions were made to further strengthen security along the so-called eastern flank of the Alliance. It's important to mention that the support for Ukraine from EU and NATO countries varies greatly. Broadly speaking, based on the scale of support, these countries can be divided into three categories. The first group includes nations such as Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania and Poland. These countries offered maximum military and humanitarian aid to Ukraine from day one. The prevailing sentiment among both government and wider society was that Ukraine was also fighting for their security and independence. It was widely believed that if Russia were to triumph over Ukraine, the former's political and military ambitions would pose a threat to their sovereignty. This belief holds serious weight, considering the numerous aggressive remarks made by Russian officials in recent years. Bold threats of deploying military force against Baltic states and Poland and questioning the necessity of their existence, have been made without any hesitation. We must remember the ultimatums issued by Russia before February 24, 2022, urging NATO member states to withdraw Allied forces from the Baltics, limit their armament, and reduce the number and scale of military exercises. In this manner, Russia continues to test the internal unity, resilience, and public reaction of NATO and the European Union. If such proposals from Russia were to be accepted, the Baltic states would effectively be demilitarized and their security would rely solely on the mercy of Russia, which is not a characteristic observed in their political culture. Alongside providing military and humanitarian aid to Ukraine, the Baltic states and Poland have ardently advocated for all types of support for Ukraine in all international formats where they were represented. Noteworthy among these are NATO, the European Union and the United Nations. 
in their bilateral relations with allies, Latvia and other aforementioned countries have argued for providing maximum military aid to Ukraine without delay. At the same time, a strict policy of international sanctions against Russia has been supported. From the very first day of Russia's attack on Ukraine, all of the aforementioned first group countries saw this as a revanchist war by Russia and an attempt to reclaim territories once conquered by the Russian Empire. It is believed that in the event of Russia's success, such a war would pose a direct threat to these countries and by extension to the NATO alliance and the European Union. This view is largely shared by the ruling circles of Finland and Sweden which served as the basis for these countries to change their foreign policy course in favour of NATO membership, understanding that it is the only way to deter Russia from potential aggression and in the event of hypothetical aggression to repel a Russian attack. The second group includes countries such as the United States, the United Kingdom, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, Finland, Sweden, the Czech Republic, the Netherlands, Italy and also Germany and France. The United States and the United Kingdom, for instance, provided the most significant military support to Ukraine at the onset of the war. Without this aid, the Ukrainian army might have struggled to withstand the Russian forces. Alongside this military assistance, the United Kingdom, particularly then Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Defence Minister Ben Wallace, extended some of the greatest political support to Ukraine placing them alongside representatives from the Baltics and Poland in terms of motivational levels. Similarly, political but with less military support were the Nordic countries, the Czech Republic, the Netherlands and Italy. As previously mentioned, Finland and Sweden, upon Russia's attack on Ukraine, made the historic decision to join NATO. This move demonstrated that, like the Baltics and Poland, they take the threats posed by Russia to national security very seriously, and recognize the impact of the war in Ukraine on future security perspectives. Now, let's consider the erstwhile engine of the European Union, France and Germany. Until February 24, 2022, their governments showed tolerance and a policy of appeasement towards Russia, evident in the numerous phone calls to the Kremlin and causing confusion among a series of allied countries. However, post the onset of the war, both nations actively joined the group of countries supporting Ukraine, providing both humanitarian and military assistance. A significant shift in Germany's defence policy occurred on February 27, 2022, known as Zeitenwende, which involved a serious commitment to strengthening the capabilities and provision of its armed forces, planning to allocate an additional 100 billion to German security over a longer period. Zeitenwende can indeed be considered the most significant political shift in German society's security issues since World War II. However, a series of critics believe that although this historic shift in German security policy was loudly declared and should be assessed very positively, its implementation is slow. Germany's military support to Ukraine for a long time was characterized as two steps forward, one step back. German society and media spent months on fruitless debates about which weapons should and should not be sent to the Ukrainian army. These discussions only delayed the much-needed military support to Ukraine. However, positive trends are also observed in Germany. German political, economic and industrial circles are slowly shaking the giant German dreadnought, and it is hoped that Germany could become the leading and most responsible European military power which, from Latvia's perspective, would be commendable if this power were ready to defend the Baltics against Russia. Certain signals indicate this, such as the German Defence Policy Guidelines, which the German Defence Minister made public on November 9, 2023. Simultaneously, Germany's commitment to significantly increase its presence in our neighbouring country, Lithuania, has also grown. Our journey begins in the early days of the Ukraine crisis, where the political stances of Western nations and a large proportion of the countries we're discussing could be described as cautiously supportive. This support evolved in Ukraine's favour only as the war escalated and the first group of nations consistently advocated for it. Decisions to provide military aid were often delayed or only partially implemented, 
This could be attributed to what we perceive as unfounded fears of further escalation of the war, which could potentially drag NATO into the conflict, and fears of Russia's loss in the war and the ensuing chaos in that country. Russian propaganda successfully exploited these fears in the West, even intensifying them by threatening both the use of nuclear weapons and a possible military conflict with NATO. Simultaneously, it was observable during the course of the war how skillfully Russia used all available resources to influence Western society through friendly parties, influence agents, politicians, the non-governmental sector and business circles. Overall, it can be argued that Russia partially succeeded in dividing public opinion in Western countries and weakening political decision-making with regard to assistance to Ukraine. As the war entered a protracted phase, there was an increasing observation of war fatigue in almost all Western countries. Unfortunately, the desire to seek a settlement with Russia is also increasing, even if it means Ukraine giving up some of the territories occupied by Russia. No decision was made about Ukraine's future in the alliance during the Vilnius-NATO summit. Perhaps something is being saved for the 2024 Washington-NATO summit, but the risks remain high that, as the war drags on, pacifist positions in this group of countries will only gain momentum. This is evidenced by individual articles in the Western press and an interview with the commander of the Ukrainian army, Zaluzhny, in The Economist in November. Fears of a possible desire to achieve Ukraine's surrender and peace worry many political and military experts, as well as the first group of countries and their societies mentioned in this article. It is believed that if Russia is not militarily defeated in this war, it will regroup and sooner or later start a new war, which in this case would directly involve NATO member states. And unfortunately, it seems that this will happen sooner rather than later. The Ukraine-Russia war has entered a protracted phase where Ukraine's victory, which would mean Russia's defeat on the battlefield, is only possible if Western allies shift their economy to a war footing similar to what the aggressor state Russia has already done. It is also necessary for Western allies to supply Ukraine with as many weapons, ammunition and combat equipment as possible, essentially everything it needs. In the current situation, it does not seem that the US administration is ready to do this for domestic and possibly foreign policy considerations. The US is approaching elections, which will decide a lot not only in the politically divided US society, but also in the outcome of the war in Ukraine. Moscow is well aware of this, so it will do everything to continue the war at least until the autumn of 2024. If US military support decreases, it will negatively affect the course of the war and also have a psychologically negative effect on both Ukrainian society and societies in the Baltic states. The Russian leadership will interpret lesser or slower support from the US and other Western countries for Ukraine as weakness in the West and primarily in the US, which will only intensify its revanchist policy towards neighbouring countries. In a world where alliances shift like sand, it's crucial to understand the dynamics of power and politics. The reduction or even a simple non-increase of support to Ukraine not only prolongs the ongoing conflict, but also encourages nations like China to question the West's ability to defend its interests with military force. A worrying trend in the current political discourse in Western media and political circles is the discussion and even questioning of the usefulness of the current level of aid. Instead, there needs to be an immediate increase in aid to cover Ukraine's needs. This has been the position of the authors of this article since the beginning of the war, namely to provide Ukraine with everything necessary so that Russia sees that it has no chance of winning this war. This is the only way to end this war as quickly as possible and not to diminish the influence of the transatlantic alliance on global security processes. Unfortunately, it does not appear that this view dominates in the leading Western countries. In Europe, the readiness to provide even greater support to Ukraine is not self-evident. This has political and purely practical reasons. The political section in early November was vividly characterized by the statement of the German Defense Minister Pistorius that Germany still will not send the much-needed Taurus missiles to Ukraine 
because there is no evidence that it could change the course of the war. Needless to say, this argument does not stand up to any criticism, as no one denies the West to provide such support to Ukraine, which would overall change the course of the war. Help is also hindered by the fact that the European industry has not yet been reoriented towards the production of such military equipment that would fully satisfy the needs of the Ukrainian army and Europe itself. For example, as a French representative expressed at a recent Riga conference, one artillery device is produced in 17 months. The same is true with the entire military-industrial complex, which in the European Union and NATO countries has been neglected since the collapse of the USSR. The Western policy of the past decade can be characterized by the theses of the book The End of History and the Last Man, written by Francis Fukuyama, which naively depicted the current security situation of the Western world, claiming that the Western liberal democratic society model has won and the big challenges are over. This worldview was accepted as truth, replacing reality with wishful thinking. Although Fukuyama has changed his opinion, Western political circles have not done so. In our understanding, another scenario proposed by Samuel Huntington in his book The Clash of Civilizations has partially come true. Pessimism about the outcome of the war in Ukraine is also caused by several other factors. For example, the position of the previously unmentioned third group of countries regarding assistance to Ukraine, which currently includes Hungary and since the last parliamentary elections also Slovakia. Both countries openly advocate for reconciliation, negotiations with Russia, do not believe in Ukraine's ability to win this self-defense war and object to providing military assistance to Ukraine. Given that both are member states of the European Union and NATO, this position undermines the unity of the European Union and NATO. In the case of Latvia, this can additionally threaten our national security as the Slovak army contingent is part of the NATO Enhanced Presence Battle Group in the territory of Latvia. The situation is also seriously affected by the latest geopolitical events in the world. Since the 7th of October, a new war has begun in the Middle East between Israel and the Hamas terrorist group. A new war has broken out in the Middle East between Israel and the terrorist group Hamas. This conflict has prompted the United States, an ally of Israel, to deploy two carrier groups to the Middle East, as well as strengthen other contingents in the region. The war could escalate if the terrorist group Hezbollah in Lebanon or even Iran were to aid Hamas. This situation could distract Western attention from the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine, thereby fostering a situation favorable to Russia. It's plausible to argue that the terrorist attack by Hamas on Israel in October did not occur without the knowledge and prior support of Russia and Iran. And there's another significant political factor at play. The presence of sizable Muslim immigrant communities in many Western countries which influences democratic decision-making in these nations. The war in the Middle East has further divided Western society where there are strong Muslim immigrant communities that stand against Israel and harbor strong anti-Semitic and anti-American sentiments. In addition to the Russia-Ukraine war and the war in the Middle East, there is constant tension in the Pacific region where Chinese and American interests collide. Increasingly, there are military exercises by China, the United States and its allies near Taiwan. If a military conflict were to break out in this region, it could negatively impact the security of the European continent. While the existence of three simultaneous wars is not very likely at present, it cannot be ruled out in the near future. The probability of a war involving Europe has significantly increased since February 2022. At the same time, societal and political division in Western Europe has grown. Many societies in Europe are grappling with internal conflicts fueled by uncontrolled migration, culture wars, social inequality, polarization, and the negative side effects of the social media and technological revolution. Over the last decade, Europe's international influence and economic competitiveness in the world have decreased. Militarily, Europe has disarmed over the past decades, leaving military power largely in the hands of the United States. In the US too, societal polarization and internal division are evident with an increasing call for isolationism. Luckily, 
The current US administration successfully resists these tendencies, but for how long? This means that Europe must be able to successfully defend itself, even if, as a result of changes in the political situation, Washington is temporarily not interested in providing sufficient support for European security, especially if the US does not increase its support for Ukraine or, in the worst-case scenario, tries to adopt a conciliatory position towards Russia, pressuring Ukraine to agree to a ceasefire, naively hoping that it could free its hands in the competition in the Pacific. Although Europe's economic potential is significantly greater than that of its closest threat, Russia this economic potential is not fully utilized to enhance the military capabilities of the countries, and society has lost the desire and skills to defend itself militarily. This encourages potential aggressors to exploit these weaknesses to achieve their interests. European political circles and society must understand that Russia is not afraid to use military force to achieve its geopolitical goals. Thanks to the war in Ukraine, Russia has transformed its economy for military needs. Mass sacrifice of people for the sake of its military interests is acceptable to both the Russian leadership and its society, which through aggressive propaganda has been opposed to Western culture and values for decades. If Russia is not defeated in the war in Ukraine, it is only a matter of time before it starts a new war under favorable circumstances. Moreover, it seems that such favorable circumstances are still developing. Currently, the long-awaited counterattack by Ukraine is stuck in a stagnant phase that is difficult to overcome without additional weapons and equipment. In the long term, this poses additional threats to Ukraine and the West as a whole. Meanwhile, Russia strengthens its self-sufficiency, in which it can remain for a long time thanks to its totalitarian governance system and politically public culture, in which the pain threshold is very high compared to the West. The closest similar regimes can be found in North Korea, Cuba and Iran. The tolerance of the Russian population for poor living conditions seems almost inexhaustible and the hatred fueled by aggressive propaganda against the West seems almost limitless. It should be expected that this state and opposition can last for a very long time. Unfortunately, as experience shows, even the presence of the highest Western military technology and well-prepared armed forces does not automatically guarantee immediate victory and lasting peace. Let's think about what Afghanistan, Iraq, or currently Gaza can teach us. Among other things that once warfare begins, it is no longer so easy to stop. Peace is a very fragile and delicate state that is very difficult to restore once armed conflicts have already begun. Any means, any efforts invested in preventing war will be many times smaller than the efforts and resources needed to stop the war afterwards. If you want peace, prepare for war. Today this sounds as relevant as ever. The transition from Russia's invasion of Ukraine to a recorded war without visible changes on the front will be presented and perceived in their society as almost a victory. This will definitely encourage future adventures which may practically require the ruling regime to maintain tension and wartime rhetoric. Not without reason, as a diversion, as a distraction, the maneuver currently being successfully used and fueled by the Russians is the conflict in the Middle East. The increasing military tension associated with China is also a cause for concern. For decades, perhaps even centuries, the ruling circles of Russia have ideologically and politically positioned themselves against the West. It's only logical to assume that future military ventures could be directed westward, making the Baltic states one of Russia's potential targets. Favorable conditions for such an adventure would include insufficient Western support for Ukraine, allowing the conflict to freeze, with Ukraine capitulating and Russia freeing up its military and economic resources. The diminishing interest and presence of the United States in Europe due to internal politics and additional global challenges could also play a part, as well as the diminishing global influence of Europe, increasing internal political and ideological discord within European societies, and the inability to recognize military threats as sufficiently real and thus not reorienting their economies to overcome their relative military weakness. What then should a nation like Latvia do in this scenario? Assuming that our independence, security and democracy are our highest values, 
from which we are not willing to back down under any circumstances. Are we in Latvia seriously preparing for the foreseeable security threats? Are we politically, psychologically, economically and militarily ready for the possible worst-case scenario? War? Only by honestly answering this question to ourselves and doing everything within our power can we maintain our independence, freedom and democracy, either by avoiding possible aggression or not losing a war if Russian aggression against us begins. One strategic goal clearly emerges in the foreground. To be prepared for national defence in the event of a real war, and to be as self-sufficient as possible and ready for successful economic operation even in global crisis conditions. Even if we successfully avoid war, such economic readiness to rely more on ourselves, our capital and our companies will be useful due to the expected effects of the impending climate crisis. The world may not be as peaceful and friendly as it is now without serious upheavals for much longer. So, what can we do in this situation and what, in our opinion, should be done? The answers can be divided into parts, foreign political activities and domestic politics. In terms of foreign political activity to strengthen our security, we can break it down into global, transatlantic, European and regional politics. Globally, the Latvian government should do everything to promote the increase of Latvia's and the Western world's weight, influence and reputation among Asian, African and Latin American countries and their societies. This includes political, cultural and economic mechanisms. The West should support its relations with countries of other continents, taking into account the national peculiarities of these countries. We should abandon the cultural arrogance characteristic of colonial times. We must understand that these countries may never become politically and culturally similar to Europe. We should strengthen ties with like-minded countries, such as Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore and others. Can Europe become a beacon of liberal democracy for the rest of the world? This question, my friends, is not merely rhetorical. It is an urgent appeal for reflection and action. Europe must strive to exemplify liberal democracy for all nations, for this represents our way of life and our values. This is especially crucial in the face of increasing immigration from regions steeped in different cultures. The challenge lies in ensuring that these cultures integrate with European values rather than threaten them with undemocratic and illiberal traditions that may have been prevalent in their former homelands. One such threat is the resurgence of anti-Semitism, fueled by these divergent worldviews. Yet, we must also acknowledge that in our fragmented world, not all nations and societies wish to live according to our values. In other words, the world is far from a place where liberal democracy could dominate and be universally accepted. In transatlantic relationships, we must exert every effort to maintain the involvement, interest and presence of the United States in European politics. The alternative is a continued weakening of Western global influence and the political and economic marginalization of Europe, unable to compete with Asian or American economies, technologies and military capabilities. It is important to emphasize that both sides of the Atlantic will benefit from a strengthened transatlantic integration. It is crucial to convince our American allies that European and American security are inseparable, as evidenced by two world wars. We must continue to explain that the outcome of the Russo-Ukrainian war will determine the future security structure of Europe and possibly the world. Appeasement will lead to a reduction in Western global influence and potentially a new global conflict, from which the United States will not be able to extricate itself. In the European continent, the greatest efforts must be made to strengthen the economic and military growth and cooperation of European Union member states. This does not automatically entail advocating for the federalization of the European Union and abandoning national politics on issues such as security, military capabilities or migration. Strengthening the influence of European Union institutions should only be supported when it brings undeniable benefits to both Latvia as a nation-state and Europe as a whole in the context of global competition. Enhancing economic competitiveness and security has been given priority for the next decade. Regional politics, we believe, can play a decisive role in Latvia's security over the next decade. Economically, 
countries often collaborate most closely with their geographically closest neighbours, and in matters of security, the quickest help and understanding can usually be expected from nearby countries. Following NATO membership, our neighbours Sweden and Finland have removed the last barrier to our military and security cooperation. Their participation in the Transatlantic Alliance gives the entire Baltic region the strategic depth it so desperately needs. Both of these new member states have significant military capabilities. Particularly in Sweden and Finland, there is a developed societal resilience, a commitment to defend the nation, substantial armed force capabilities, and a relatively developed military industry. A serious attitude towards security matters is also observable in Poland, where military capabilities and the national military industry are being developed. Poland is among the key countries for regional security in the event of a Russian invasion in the Baltic region. Efforts must continue to activate military industry and security cooperation with Germany among the Baltic Sea region countries. Germany is not only geographically close to Latvia, but it is also the largest economy in Europe. Have you ever wondered why some nations, despite their small size, seem to hold a certain resilience, a certain determination to defend their very existence? Let's delve into the story of a few such nations, Sweden, Finland and Poland. These nations, especially Sweden and Finland, have developed a robust societal resilience, a commitment to defend their country, a remarkable military capability and a relatively advanced military industry. In particular, Poland's serious approach to security issues is commendable. The nation is developing its military capabilities and national military industry, playing a crucial role in regional security, especially in the event of a Russian invasion in the Baltic region. But the Baltic Sea region's nations must not rest on their laurels. They must continue to stimulate their military industries and security cooperation, particularly with Germany. After all, Germany is not only geographically close to Latvia, but it is also the largest economy in Europe. However, Germany's political circle's willingness to consider Baltic security interests and implement a real Zeitenwender, casting aside illusions of cooperation with Russia, has seen varying success. Yet work with Germany must continue. Beyond the region, the war in Ukraine has demonstrated the necessity to strengthen relations with decisive nations, the United Kingdom and the United States. Ukraine, currently engaged in war, will emerge as one of Europe's strongest nations ready to defend its own and allied security once the war ends. It is crucial to promote economic and military cooperation with Ukraine while facilitating Ukraine's swift entry into the European Union and NATO. Ukraine's participation in these organizations should be a strategic goal of Latvian foreign policy. Turning to domestic actions to bolster our security, the current international situation, the waning Western influence globally, the increasing number of security challenges, long-running debates about aid to Ukraine in the US and Europe, and difficult discussions within NATO about an increased military presence in Latvia, make it clear that a significant part of saving the drowning lies in the hands of the drowning themselves. If we want to secure ourselves against a potential Russian invasion, we must do everything to ensure that Latvia's military capabilities, military industry, supply reserves and societal readiness and psychological resilience are at the highest level. Latvian security policy must be based on the principle of total defence, regardless of our membership in NATO and the European Union. In the face of current global challenges, one can never have too much security. Total defence is the only national-level policy that could deter Russia from attacking Latvia or successfully resist Russia if it chose to attack us. Of course, Latvia would not be able to withstand a prolonged war with Russia alone, but by doing all the homework correctly, there is a very high chance that Russia would consider such an attack as disproportionate to the possible gains. This would give time to activate all international mechanisms to mobilize appropriate allied support where Russia cannot hope for victory. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Latvian governments have emphasized security as the main government priority, strengthening the national armed forces and working on a comprehensive national defense system. However, we must not stop at what has been achieved so far, for there is still much to do and time is of the essence. 
What if we could bolster our national security, not only through increased budgets or advanced military technology, but by investing in our most valuable asset, our people? Welcome to a discussion on the importance of enhancing Latvia's defence capabilities. Firstly, the defence budget needs to be increased. No expense is too great when it comes to preserving peace. The budget should reflect our need for serious military capabilities. Currently, Latvia's defence budget is set to reach 3% of the GDP by 2027. Alongside this, there's a separate budget line for the purchase of mid-range air defence systems worth roughly 1 billion euros. This is good, but we must be prepared to increase the defence budget even beyond 3% over the next three years for combat capabilities, personnel, military industry and total defence system development. When it comes to capabilities, we need to learn from the examples of the war in Ukraine and consider enhancing all types of firepower of the land forces, including armoured vehicles and reactive artillery. In air defence, we need to think about additional anti-drone systems and anti-ballistic capabilities. Work should continue on coastal missile defence systems and sea drone capabilities. Development of air, land and sea drones, electronic warfare capabilities capable of preventing drone attacks. And of course, cyber security should be prioritised. Investments in special operations units should continue developing their capabilities. Other capabilities not mentioned here should also be developed. To develop these capabilities, we need qualified human resources, a serious national military industry and a society ready to defend itself. Given that Latvian society is numerically small, it is crucial that all members of society understand their abilities and role in a crisis or potential war situation. Not everyone needs to be in the armed forces, but there must be enough militarily educated people for such a situation, as well as developed civil defence infrastructure and personnel that can engage in civil defence through internal affairs, health defence or another sector. The current approved state defence concept stipulates that in case of war there should be 61,000 militarily prepared people in Latvia. We believe that this number should not be the limit, conceptually and ideally it should grow to 100, 120,000 considering the population of Latvia and comparing with the number of inhabitants and militarily prepared people in Finland. This means that the number of conscripts must be increased, the state defence education must be improved, which interests and prepares technologically knowledgeable and patriotic people. Reservist training should be promoted, involvement in the National Guard, but the main emphasis on the state defence service and the education necessary for military capabilities. Ever pondered over the significance of a comprehensive defence system, the kind that involves each citizen from the soldier on the front line to the civil service worker in the heart of the city? Imagine a nation, specifically Latvia, preparing for a crisis or conflict. In such a scenario, not every citizen will be part of the national armed forces, yet each individual could play an essential role in defending themselves and their homeland. This involves preparing additional civil defence reserves for the state border guard, police, fire and rescue services, and even the medical sector. However, as we speak, solutions to this pressing issue are being approached rather slowly and bureaucratically. There is noticeable progress in the development of military medicine, but it demands a synergy between hospitals and the Ministry of Defence and National Armed Forces. This collaboration aims to maximise the development of military medicine and related capabilities. Moreover, a comprehensive state defence system also includes reserves of material resources in all areas, a task that cannot be accomplished without additional budgets and infrastructure. The infrastructure issue is critical for both the capabilities of the National Armed Forces and Latvia as a host country expecting assistance from allies. At the same time, it's necessary to develop border defence infrastructure to prevent the invading forces from penetrating deeper into Latvian territory. This perspective has been reflected in the decisions taken at the Madrid and Vilnius NATO summits. Here, one could invite the European Union to participate in the joint construction of an eastern border with additional funding, thereby strengthening this border militarily, from the north of Finland to the south of Poland. The development of the military industry is incomplete without state involvement. Unlike other industries in a free market, 
The military industry's purpose is not merely to participate in the market, make money, promote employment and exports. It's always been associated with state interests, which, in turn, are security and defence. Investing in the military industry doesn't just provide the necessary technological support for the armed forces, it also stimulates the economy in the most effective way. Since 2012, Latvia has been making promising strides in the military industry. Although a small country, it faces massive competition in the global market. Latvia's drone industry is among the best developed in the Baltic states. The country also leads in the military automotive industry in the region, producing armoured vehicles like Patria and developing off-road prototypes like Fox. In the near future, Latvia hopes to collaborate with Finnish, French and other companies in establishing a joint ammunition and explosives factory, which would be the first in the region. This brief narrative doesn't cover all aspects of Latvia's military industry development. However, it's clear that Latvia's defence and security are unimaginable without investments and the development of the military industry. The war in Ukraine shows that resource scarcity is a critical factor in any conflict. And currently, there's a worldwide shortage of these resources, with no immediate signs of improvement. The war in Ukraine shows that resource scarcity is a crucial factor in any military operation and currently there is a shortage of these resources worldwide with no indication that the situation will rapidly change in a positive direction. We believe that in the field of military industry there should be a national order and national capability to provide ourselves with as much as possible in the next 10 years. We cannot rely solely on allied supplies because even if there is political will, there will be no opportunity. Considering that the Western military industry is not capable of supplying itself with everything necessary, even in peacetime, let alone in wartime, economically, it is time to seriously develop our own production. It is good to respect foreign investments, but it is time to respect and take care of our own local capital companies, at least as much as the state cares about foreigners. It is good that there is such a Foreign Investors Council in Latvia, which has the right to meet with the government and discuss all relevant issues. Moreover, it would be good if local national capital companies had a similar opportunity to be respected and heard by the government. Otherwise, it sometimes seems that the local entrepreneur and his invested capital are left in a kind of child's role then let's not be surprised that foreigners gradually take over the industry sector by sector. We need our own. Our production, our high technology capabilities, our educated workforce, also our military production, the drone industry, military engineering, information technology, food supply, logistics need to be significantly developed. In a critical situation, we can only rely on ourselves. In addition, the development of production and greater self-sufficiency will definitely not be detrimental even in peacetime. Sivis pacem parabellum, this ancient Roman saying has not lost its meaning in modern times. If you want peace, be prepared to fight if necessary. In this article, we wanted to remind Latvia's and the Allies, policymakers, experts and the wider society that we live in turbulent times. Our freedom and our security are more threatened than ever. This insecurity has a number of causes and reasons, among which the ambitions of totalitarian Russia near our borders should be highlighted, as well as tectonic changes in world geopolitics that bring new challenges to everyone. We must be ready for them. To guarantee Latvia's security, we must not only be internationally active in all possible formats, meeting with both our allies and representatives of other regions, but also invest maximally in Latvia's national security and defence. In the past 30 years, Latvia has managed to regain its lost independence, return to the European political and cultural environment, join all major international organisations including the European Union and NATO. In the eyes of many foreign observers, we have achieved a miracle that many no longer believed in. Unfortunately, dark clouds of war are beginning to loom over our country and perhaps the whole world. In such a situation, the most correct thing to do is to do everything possible to prevent Latvia from experiencing another war. Because who knows it better than our people, who have survived two world wars, lost around 30% of the population, as well as our statehood. 
We are ready to do everything to prevent a similar scenario from happening again. Therefore, this article has been written to motivate all of us to invest more effectively in Latvia's defence.